What is up, Philadelphia? We are live. No, it is not the 4th and John podcast, but whether the 4th and John YouTube series, the podcast is coming back the first Tuesday before the regular season opener. But I got my man, Gail Saunders, a.k.a. Mr. Eagle Session. So, uh, Gail... Uh, I don't know if you heard the news today, <laughs> but uh, but a lot went on. Definitely, definitely, a lot, a lot went on. I mean, you started off the day. I saw saw, saw some of your tweets. Uh, you know, talking about getting rid of J Matt, and it, it, you know, obviously that's been the news going around for for months. So I mean, you know, whether he was on the bubble or the the, the trade block or not, it happened today. Uh, were you shocked? Uh, yeah, yes and no, because if you really take a look at it, trading Jordan Matthews made a whole lot of sense right? Uh, for, for a long time now, but I really think the first preseason game kind of, kind of iced it because number one, Howie Roseman and the coaching staff and the front office got an opportunity to see how well these wide receivers would do in their first preseason game. And on the opposite side of the bit, the field. I think this uh, that whole entire group had an opportunity to see how the defensive backfield looked in the first preseason game, and that uh, prompted Howie Roseman to start picking up the phone and uh, call up the Buffalo Bills. So why don't you break down for the people the trade? Well, I mean, uh, you know, the, the Eagles we receive uh, all world Ronald Darby. Um, you know, he's he's not the legitimate number one shutdown corner that everyone's hoping for but he's a serviceable corner and he's probably the best player that the Eagles could get their hand on I mean look at time of the season that we're we're heading into the season and we're getting a starting caliber corner Uh, so in that you know with that being said you have to give up their round pick and a lot of people are like that's very costly obviously we're in a between a rock and a hard place uh, with a guy like Patrick Robinson you know I for me, looking at this cornerback group, I, I, there's no way you can go into a season and uh, want to be competitive with a guy like Patrick Cop- Robinson right across the way. So, and, and and also too, this trade makes a lot of sense. There is zero difference, absolutely zero difference. And I tweeted this out earlier this morning that uh, there was zero difference between the Eagles trading Jordan Matthews with one year left on his deal and absolutely no intention of signing him long-term to an extension than when uh, the Baltimore Ravens traded us Timmy Jernigan and we swapped third-round picks. Uh, You know, he had one year left on his deal, good player, but wasn't in their long-term scheme or long-term plans, so they traded him to the Philadelphia Eagles and at least got some value while they could. Same applies to Jordan Matthews. This is not a knock on the type of uh, receiver Jordan Matthews is because he's a good receiver. This is not the type of teammate that he is because he's a good locker room guy. This is more along the lines of looking at the wide receiver position, the additions that the Eagles made in free agency, in the offense, getting a legitimate number one and number two, and also on the back end in the draft, drafting a guy like Mack Hollins. Uh, Sheldon Gibson is still a question mark. I'm not even sure if he makes his team, which is a little bit of a surprise, but you still got Nelson Aguilar developing now that he doesn't have to be the man. You still got Bryce Treggs who performed incredibly well. This this is nothing different than what the Baltimore Ravens did. And it's not a knock on Jordan Matthews whatsoever. I mean, I I really, I really think it's, you know, it's the situation. I mean, you really have to just look at the situation that we are in. Like they're looking at themselves. Like there's no way we can go into the season. Right. that kind of corner play opposite of Jalen Mills. There's no way. I mean, you, you can't. You can't be competitive in the NFC East when you got to go up against Des Bryant, Odell Beckham Jr., uh, Brandon Marshalls, the uh, you know Josh Doctions of the world, the um, Terrell Pryors of the world. I mean, you need some cornerback play. And, and like last season, all I just kept going on about. It. You, you can't leave the front. Uh, the front doors are locked with the defensive. End ends the defensive tackles in there but the side doors are open with Nolan Carroll the Otis McKelvin they couldn't they couldn't stop guys on the slant uh that's that was our weakness and I, I feel like you know they got a guy in Darby who can uh make plays on the ball you know he what he had uh double digit uh pass defenses last year so I mean that's big he didn't get that many interceptions but hey he, he defended passes and, and he has he's rocking the 4-3 speed 
And, you know, when we left last season, when the season was over in 2016 there, we wanted to see some things, and we didn't want to see a lot of things. The one thing we couldn't wait to see was the progression that Carson Wentz in his second year. But here's what we didn't want to see. We didn't want to see receivers dropping the ball. We didn't want to see the interior of the offensive line giving up sacks. We didn't want to see... Uh, you know, lack of pass production on the other side of Brandon Graham. We didn't want to see our secondary getting burned. We we didn't want to see more than we saw, right? Does that make any sense? So what did the Eagles do in the offseason, right? They went out, they addressed the wide receiver position. They addressed the interior of the offensive line. They, they traded for Timmy Jernigan. They drafted a guy like Derek Barnett. The one thing that they really didn't get the opportunity to address was the quarterback position because, hey, you just run out of, like, resources. You simply do. You just run right. out of resources to address every single need on this team. So what do they do? They take a look at the wide receiver position. They realize, like, unlike last year, those two simple additions during uh, free agency, all of a sudden now you're kind of, I don't want to say stacked at the wide receiver, but you, but you have a well-rounded wide receiver core. All of a sudden, Jared Matthews becomes expendable. I don't know how people don't like this trade. I, I know there's a sentimentality and, 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 and a – and a like for Jordan Matthews and his production. He has been productive-ish, all right, sometimes during garbage time, but he's not like he's lighting the world on fire, and he's a wonderful teammate. But when you're able to take him, package him with a third-round pick, and send him to Buffalo, which then in turn addresses a major hole, a, did you really want to go into this season right? Why, it, it, putting Carson Wentz in a position every single game where he had to win a shootout right. because the quarterbacks were giving up touchdowns and he had to sling the ball all over the place. I mean, I mean, now you got a guy that can play on an island. Uh, he's good in man coverage. Uh, you got a guy that can play and press. I mean, that's what you need. I mean, that 1.5 second that we're talking about giving this defensive line, that's what you need. Uh, and people, you know, they can poo poo on the giving up the third, but if you got to make a desperation move like this, this is what it takes. Uh, obviously, we have a one, we have three fours, five, a six, and a seven. Uh, one of those fours could turn into a three from the Eric Rowe to the Patriots trade. Uh, I believe he, if he plays like 50% of the snaps or something like that. So that could turn into a third. Uh, obviously, you want to have a second round pick in the draft next year, maybe something that they could finagle something, a player or whatever to get up into the second if they have to or if they have to move back or if we're in the Super Bowl and we win it, uh, you know, we'll be at the top of, you know, 32nd pick. It doesn't really matter. Uh, anyway, I mean, it's it's it's, 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 it's things you got, you know, it's a, a trade that Howie uh, he finessed another trade. And hopefully this one p pans out, but um, yeah, and the, and the third round pick does sting a little. You know how I feel about it draft picks i don't like trading any of them i try i try to treat them like gold bullion because that's really how you build a franchise and stands right now the eagles don't have a pick on the second day the second round pick was part of the carson wentz trade um what else uh the third round pick was part of the uh you, you know this trade with buffalo so as it stands right now you don't have a second day pick Yes, that's a concern, but you got to understand, give Howie the time to work. I mean, he went to the John Dorenbaugh school of learning how to pull picks out of a hat, okay? Mm -hmm. So this guy is going to have plenty of time to figure out what to do on day two. Like you mentioned, they have a couple fourth-round picks. They can either move up or maybe that Eric Rowe pick might, uh, might, might become a blessing in disguise, and he plays 50% of the snaps, and it moves up to a, to a third. But allow Howie Roseman to make them. I know the third round pick stings. I know it almost stings more than Jordan Matthews, in in, in my opinion. But uh, but yeah, in. I mean the long term, you know, of you just you think like you know you're are you gonna are you gonna put the season on the line here? For me, that's that's how important for me it was because I mean I thought like if we go we're giving up the season here, not the season season, but like if you're trying to make a, a run to the playoffs. You're not gonna you're not gonna be able to do so with a guy like Robinson, um, and I, this also kind of tells us a little bit about you know Russell uh, Douglas's progression hasn't been as fast as they liked because if he was something of a, a starting caliber, you'd see him in there. Um, obviously, this is only, only first game of preseason, but they're seeing what they see in practice. Obviously, this is why they make a move. 
And it's and everyone's been talking about the defensive line. You know, Fletcher Cox now has Timmy Jernigan next to him. Who, who do you double? Who do you try to block? Derek Barnett's on one side. Brandon Graham's on the other side. That's all fine, well, and good. And Jim Schwartz has a system where the, those guys are going to eat and get after the quarterback. But that doesn't make a goddamn bit of difference if they follow the Green Bay Packers mm-hmm. blueprint to yeah. beating the Philadelphia Eagles, which is unloading the ball within within two seconds to the outside because these, these cornerbacks can't cover. The strength of your defensive line doesn't mean ugats unless you have the corners exactly. to properly cover. And if anything, this guy's going to help buy that. How many times did you see Fletcher Cox or Vinnie Curry or Brandon Graham? Almost. They almost got there. If they only they, – they were one step behind. Well, you know what? Having quarterbacks that can cover buys you that extra couple steps and allows you defensive line to get to the quarterback. It, 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 it's, a total, it, it's a total reciprocal thing. You know, you can't have one without the other. Yeah. If, if the secondary fails, the defensive line is going to fail. I don't care who you have up there. I, I think uh, Stafford, uh, Matt Stafford and the Lions, they, they, I mean, they had the fami- familiarity with Schwartz, and I, they were the first to start doing it. Um, and then it opened up the, you know, everybody watches the tape and like, all right, this is pick on Nolan Carroll Day and Leotis McKelvin, and they all did it. So, I mean, you just think. I mean, it, if we get – we have, like – Deep, like serviceable play from the cornerback position, we're gonna see a world of difference. Um, we're gonna see more sacks, covered sacks. We're gonna see, uh, you know, uh, we could see more interceptions as well. So I mean, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm all for it. I love this trade. What 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 uh, what would you grade this trade if you had to? Uh, in terms of. Uh, you know, saving the season a B a B plus, in terms of like being a draft uh, geek and you know lo- you know draft is everything to me. Uh, I'd say a B. Uh, okay. And we're we're just in a stuck in a, a rock in a hard place. And these are the kind of moves that you have to do when you're in the situation that we're in. Yeah, I'm I'm right there with you. I would grade it a B B B plus. <clears throat> Obviously, nobody likes a third round pick. Yeah, you know. Dar- Darby balled out as a rookie. I mean, he was like the one of the he was one of the top corners rookie of, players of the year. Yeah, yeah, the top rookie corners and top defensive rookies. Uh, you know that year, he had a little bit of a slide last year, but you know we'll see. It it it, it improves the defense tremendously, and in turn takes away from the offense slightly because mm-hmm. Jordan Matthews was going to be your number three slot receiver. So really. Really, as a number three slot receiver, think you can think about Edelman, you can think about Cole Beasley, you can think about other good guys in the slot. But really, what does a slot receiver get you? Six to seven hundred yards, five, six, seven yards. Maybe. What's that? Seven, eight hundred yards. Seven, eight hundred yards tops. So, are you willing to commit a year to Jordan Matthews? Knowing you probably have somebody on this roster who can do get you that, you know, six, seven, even eight hundred yards if we're really pushing. It's a third receiver, or you can have a starting cornerback. I mean, just just laying it out like that, this trade makes so much sense. I, I, I said on Twitter basically today that this team was, you know, more in need of a starting cornerback versus a slot receiver in order to make a run at the playoffs. Uh, right. It's you know, we have players that have shown potential to, you know, uproot J Matt. Uh, I guess you know Aguilar's look good in the off season. Um, you know, you have a guy like Greg Ward. You have a guy like Marcus Johnson, who have also played well. Um, Bryce Craig's also. Um, you know, Jordan Matthews has been. Uh, he's been basic. I, I I hate to put his whole career in a basic category, but. You know he's been based. He's made. You know I'll 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 always love Jay Matt for that touchdown against the Dallas Cowboys. I'll always love Jay Matt for his professionalism. I will always love his. Uh, you know, the, he's willing to do more. Uh, a story about J- Jordan Matthews before going uh, in the draft process. Jordan Matthews was the only receiver to call Phil Savage at the Senior Bowl to get footage of every single. Uh, defensive back that was going to the Senior Bowl because he wanted to do his homework 
prior to going to the Senior Bowl. So that's the type of guy uh, who you know you want in your locker room. That's the type of guy that you want around your younger receivers. Uh, so I thank him for that. Yeah, and and again, we I think the Eagles fan base as a whole doesn't see this as a knock on mm-hmm. Jordan Matthews. Jordan Matthews is well respected, despite some of the struggles that he's had on the field, despite some of the drops. Uh, he was asked to do be basically a number one when in reality he's a number two, right. and he did that with what he could work with, and uh, never complained, never bitched, never moaned. Always was a class act. Uh, so he's well respected among the fan base. Um, but when you're able to get this value, you know it, it is what it is. You have to make the move. Now you said earlier, uh, you brought up the Cowboys. The the other interesting little bit of news today. Uh, I don't know if you heard, but uh, <laughs> Cowboys running back, Ezekiel Elliott, is yeah. much to the chagrin of Jerry Jones, who is rumored to be furious about the situation, has been suspended for the first six games of the season. Yet another Dallas Cowboy making headlines for the wrong reason and sitting games out in the beginning of the season. Gail, your thoughts on Mr. Elliott? Sitting his fat rear end, big old rump down on the bench. I mean, I mean, the writing was on the wall. We knew something was coming. Uh, not to this extent. Maybe a four, two game suspension, six game suspension with no real, uh, you know, facts that have come through. Obviously, the NFL has done their homework. They may have a Um, but I mean, Ezekiel. I mean, you're the face of the franchise. You can't be out there. Uh, you know, doing some of the things that you're doing, punching a DJ, maybe uh, grabbing a titty um, down in New Orleans that pops out. You just, like, you can't do that. Uh, I mean, you just, you know, I, he had it coming. Um, but obviously, as Eagle fans, we are happy. A six-game suspension. Uh, we know about a 10-game suspension that we dealt with with Lane Johnson last season. Um, now Dallas Cowboy fans are like, we could do it without him. What say you, Mr. Uh, Eron? Oh, I had fun with the Dallas Cowboys fans on Twitter today. I, I, I was a little extra about it. I mean, it, it, you're, it's amazing how, A, the Cowboys fans just all of a sudden turn and say, well, we don't need Zeke. Anybody can run uh, behind that offensive line. You know, we, uh, Darren McFadden, he can run behind that offensive line. Last year, Eagles fans were saying, yeah, Zeke is a product. Uh, he's a good running back, but he's a product of a great offensive line. And uh, what did Dallas fans say? Ah, it doesn't. It's not the line. It's Zeke. It's not the now that Zeke's out. All the offensive now. It, it, I've never seen a more brainwashed and brain dead group of individuals like Dallas Cowboys Twitter. They are by far the biggest morons on that entire app right there. Yeah. And it, uh, I was having fun with them because a lot of them didn't believe. You know, hey, they were taking the Greg Hardy defense. Like, yeah, she didn't fuck. You know, she didn't testify. No charges. No charges, no crime, no crime, no suspension. You know what I mean? Everything goes hush hush. Uncle Jerry writes a check and just sends it off to whoever, and the DJ, you know, all of a sudden all the social media accounts disappear and all these problems disappear. I'm thrilled to death that, what is it, not a couple days after Jerry Jones is giving his Hall of Fame induction speech, he's sitting there livid and learns the lesson that, look, you can't just buy your way out of your out of your players' problems. You can't. You know he's writing checks to keep these guys out of trouble, and they're getting in trouble anyway. The Dallas Cowboys are a talented team on the field, but I don't give a good golly damn how much talent you have on the sideline or in or on the field. If you don't have leadership from your key players, you are doomed for failure. And Ezekiel Elliott has to be better, not on the field, but off of it in order for that organization to go nowhere. And unfortunately for them, and luckily for us, they're stepping on their own dicks. Hey, I mean, I, hey keep, keep, keep doing it. Uh, I don't care. Uh, it's great for meme work. It oh. keeps us uh, busy in the off season. But um, I, I just really don't understand what's going on there. Like, I don't know kind of culture they're, they're cultivating and not it really doesn't seem like they're trying to rein people in i don't uh, it's i mean it's come to a head this season oh they're trying they're trying to rein people in oh they rein lucky whitehead in 
when he was uh, shoplifting in Oh, yeah, that's right. He wasn't even in Virginia. His flight hasn't even landed, and the guy's falsely identified him, but we're going to go ahead and just cut him anyway. Yeah, that, that, that's the cowboy way there. You go and, uh, you know, release the innocent man. Meanwhile, he got all these dipshits. And it and I love how the Cowboys fans are sitting there boo-hooing and crying like the league is targeting us. Oh, the league's just picking on us. Oh, the league hates the Cowboys. Here's an idea. Stop signing and drafting assholes. Then maybe you won't have this problem. It's a good thought, right? The weed. The weed. Yeah. I mean, I, I yeah, I mean, it's all good, it's all- but uh how about Carl Quince? Uh, all this, all this, a lot of news went on, and, and we, we've forgotten about Carson Wentz. Oh, we didn't forget about Carson Wentz. Uh, Carson Wentz looks good. He, he does look good. Uh, I mean, when you shrug off a uh, uh, a guy named Clay Matthews, like, eh, <laughs> move to the right, throw across your body. Yeah. Accurate. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's pretty impressive. I, I feel like, uh, you know, us moving into the season, we're, we're almost there. I think we're headed in the right place with our Eagles. I think, uh, you gotta be excited about the, the de- development of, of Carson Wentz and the progression. Um, I think it's, uh, it's, it's imperative. I think, you know, us, he's, lo- he's losing Jordan Matthews, but he's gaining Torrey Smith. He's gaining Alshon Jeffrey. And hopefully- he's gaining the ball back. That's what right? he's gaining. He's gaining the ball back. Uh, Carson, Carson, it's it's he's in the driver's seat right now. Um, yeah. Watching him during that preseason game move around the pocket, dodge defenders, not get sacked, extend the play, keep the play alive. All the meanwhile, his eyes are down the field and complete a pass was like so reminiscent of a young Donovan McNabb and that people forget how good a young Donovan I'm not talking about the Super Bowl year I'm talking about 2000 2001 2002 2003 when he was still learning the quarterback position when his arc was like this I feel like 2004 2005 he plateaued he, he got as good as he was going to get all the way up to 2007, and then it fell off. But that, that incline of his career was so dynamic and so exciting to watch. And he did stuff like that, and that jump from the year one to year two, five made an unbelievable jump, and I see that in Carson. Except, I dare I say, I see better. Because I think he's got a better accuracy. I think he's a better leader. I think he's a smarter player. I think he's a harder worker. And that rubs off. I mean, here's a guy that during the offseason, unsolicited by the Eagles, went to some quarterback guru to work on his mechanics. He never saw five do that. Five hit the gym. He'd show up to training camp the next year all jacked up like he was, you know, you might want to go HGH test number five and see what's going on there. But I think Carson Wentz, Reminds me of that, and that's so exciting. I mean, it's something to to, to uh, give you something to live for as an Eagle fan. Uh, right. I, obviously, I feel like Carson Wentz is a uh, guy. His, his intangibles are there. I mean, he, he just – I mean, he has a city that's bad. I feel like, you know, McNabb didn't really have the city. He had, he, he had parts of the city back in him. Some, you know, it was weird. It was all – it was weird. Um it got weird after the Super Bowl. It got weird after got the Super weird. Bowl. But, uh, yeah, man, I'm excited, man. I, I really can't even, you know, that last night was enough to, that was the injection. I'm just like, oh, I need more. Uh, are you, are you going to be at the uh, the next preseason game? Oh, I will, absolutely, 100%. I'll be there. I, uh, preseason or not, I, I, I don't like to miss games. So I, I will be there. If anybody, uh, I'll probably be in Section 225. Um, Gail, you gonna make it? I'll probably have an extra ticket. I think so, maybe. Yeah. I was in. I always ride by the seat of my pants. I still don't. I'm, you know, yeah. I'm always last minute, dude. But uh, yeah. Let me know because we got the ones in two twenty five and two twenty six. So chances are, I mean, we're not filling those seats. So I'll, I'll probably have an extra one if you can get off of work. I definitely can. So, but Eagles fans, real bad. Going back, getting to it. 
you know, the excitement that the, the season's finally here. You have a second year quarterback who's ready to make that light year jump into his, you know, sophomore season. You have an offensive line now that is not only healthy, Lane Johnson is not suspended, and the interior of the offensive line has been shored up. You have wide receivers who can now not only catch a ball, but blow the top off the defense, are reliable, and are threats, and the defense has to respect. You've got running backs in LeGarrette Blunt, who's a bruiser. Darren Sproles, who's a burner. Wendell Smallwood, we have yet to see. Donald Pumphrey, Pumphrey wasn't exactly uh, you know, impressive in his debut. But you have a good set of running backs right there. You have a d- defensive line who is foaming at the mouth to get to the quarterback. Mm-hmm. You now have a secondary, while not best in the league, but uh, you have cornerbacks who are service- more than serviceable. They're starting quality cornerbacks. You have a set of safeties back there uh, who are good, Rodney McLeod and, 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 and Malcolm Jenkins. And your linebacker Jordan Hicks is coming back uh, healthy. So there's a lot to – there's a lot, a lot. A lot to look forward to this season. And I really think not only is this the most improved team in the NFL, it's the most improved team in the most improved division. And even though the Cowboys are talented and the Giants added an offensive weapon and their defense is legit, and even though the Redskins, the Redskins are going to Redskin, even though the Redskins have our number, I see the Philadelphia Eagles, as I sit here right now, after the first preseason game, I see the Philadelphia Eagles winning the NFC East. Ooh, hot take early in the summer. No, I, I feel like we, we can make a run. I, I'm talking with uh, Twitter fans from Giant Land in my mentions. Uh, I mean, you know, I, like I said, I, I didn't think this team could make a run at a playoffs with the cornerbacks that we had. Now I feel like Yes, we have a shot. I feel like, you know, you talk about taking the top off the defense. We have a guy, Torrey Smith. And you look at a play like last night, uh, that play that Mac Collins caught underneath. Who was the guy that took the top off the defense on that play? Torrey Smith took the safety and the corner, allowing Matt Collins to do his thing. And Alshon Jeffrey, a chain mover. Uh I mean, we haven't even seen the tip of the iceberg yet. So obviously, uh, it's it's a lot to be excited about. And, and, and uh, I mean, the media is slowly coming around. Who's the dude from um, from Fox? Uh, Coward. Yeah, he, he actually picked the Eagles to win the NFC East, like yourself. Um, yeah, well, you know what? That that that's okay. We don't need to fly under the radar. That's what the Eagles have been doing all season. I said it on my video on on my YouTube channel. You know, the Eagles are flying under the radar, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. I don't know how they've had the best off season in the NFL yet. Nobody's talking about them. Everybody's too busy talking about the dumpster fires that are the other teams in the NFC East. You know, what's going on here? What's going on there? And uh, it's nice just to be hush. You know, quite sneaking up on them. Sneaking up on them. Hey, I'll take I'll take this position, man. This is where we need to be. Stay humble. Be humble. Get down. Get down. You know what I'm saying? Let's let us let us uh let, let's rock into this uh My left stroke just went by <laughs> Yeah, man. I'm excited. So uh before we get on out of here, a couple uh a couple housekeeping notes. Fourth and John, the podcast will air the first Tuesday before the regular season opener. From uh, New Media Studios, make sure we'll be broadcasting at like uh, from 8 to 9.30, so make sure you tune in for that. We're also going to have the YouTube videos just like we did last year. Next Saturday, uh, our boy Tom Oresco, an occasional 4th and John uh, contributor who has been out in L.A. Why is he in L.A.? Because he's making moves. That's what you do out in L.A. You try to produce something. You try to act something. You try to get something going, and he's bringing that all the way back to Philadelphia and shooting a now I don't I know some of the details I don't know all of the details but he's shooting a uh, television series based on basically Philadelphia fans and like the tailgate culture kind of uh, if you can imagine like the league you know what I mean so so along that genre it's a comedy but it's based around you know the tailgating here in Philadelphia which we personally experienced 
experience have uh, you know have a lot of fun with. So he's actually shooting the pilot for his show. So at Tom Oresco, you also know him from views uh, from the link here on YouTube. Contact him. We're all going to be down there. We're going to be posting up like a mock-up tailgate and kind of uh, helping him out with his uh, with his shoot there. Uh, but, 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 I'm trying to think what else. What else we got going on? Uh, hope to see you at the preseason game. Follow us at 4th and John on Twitter. 4th and John Facebook page. Uh, on Instagram at 4th and John. Uh, follow this man over here. At Eagle Sessions. There you go. Follow this guy, uh, the Mighty E Rock, on Twitter. If you don't know his name by now. Yep, and uh, we're excited, man. We're excited. So until next time, let's go, birds, and we will see you at the second preseason game. Nice.